When we hear information repeated to us, we're hardwired to begin to believe it. The positive effect we feel when we hear the information or story repeated is called the illusory truth effect. We have a pretty good example of the illusory truth effect in my family. I remember the story of why we adopted two cats very differently than everyone else. I am stuck on believing that we went to the animal shelter to meet a big, white, fluffy dog to potentially make our own. I have what I think is a memory of my dad showing me a page on Pet Finder with that big, fluffy dog. It is entirely possible that I am conflating seeing other big, white, fluffy dogs with what inspired our trip to the animal shelter. The rest of my family maintains that the plan was always to adopt a cat. They tell me that perhaps I did meet a big white fluffy dog that day, but that we weren't there to meet him. And listen, I know the numbers are against me. This is a thing I can acknowledge. But I've repeated to myself for more than 20 years now that we went to meet a dog. I've rationalized it, too. Most of us are allergic to cats, and I can tell myself over and over that we wouldn't go to meet a cat that most of us were allergic to, that we went to meet a dog and that my mom met a giant adult cat that she simply couldn't leave at the shelter to some unknown but probably terrible fate. But the more I tell myself that story, the deeper it imprints into my memory. A false memory by all other accounts. Following the death of Michael DeLeon, hospital corpsman second-class Maybane very nearly benefited from a much darker example of the illusory truth effect. This is Conduct Unbecoming. I'm Erin, and I'm your host. Michael DeLeon joined the Navy in November 2014. He was selected as a hospital corpsman. Following his graduation from the hospital corpsman school, DeLeon received orders to the U.S. Naval Hospital 29 Palms. After that first tour, he continued supporting Marine Corps training at the 29 Palms Marine Corps Air Ground Combat Center. He worked hard to support a variety of field exercises while still maintaining his other duties, and he began to prepare for a unit deployment program, a UDP, to rotate him through Okinawa. He would have been there while we were there. As De Leon worked up his deployment, he continued to spend time with his friends, many of whom served alongside him as corpsmen. On August 16, 2019, De Leon went to a party at Hospital Corpsman 2nd Class Petty Officer Edmund Maybane's house. Four other corpsmen attended the party, Ryan Deeney, Mason Williams, Sterling Wald, and Jesse Humes. They all bear hospital corpsman titles, but it's a mouthful, so I hope you forgive me for shortcutting their introductions. The opinion gives each of them pseudonyms, but it was pretty easy to unscramble the phonetic alphabet and figure out who everyone was, but I did need to keep a legend of which pseudonym was which while researching this case. The group arrived to Maybane's home between 6.30 and 7 p.m. and had what started as a pretty typical hang. They cooked food, listened to music, smoked cigars, and drank some alcohol. At some point in the evening, Maybane decided to show Williams his new Springfield 9mm pistol. While we lived in Okinawa, the military encouraged a not-one-drop approach to driving, because the DUI limits are much lower overseas in Japan than they are in the United States. We've taken that not-one-drop rule, and we've carried it forward back here in the United States. 
If we've had any adult beverages, we do not get behind the wheel. It's a bright line rule that really works for us. I think the not one drop rule applies equally successfully to handling firearms, but these men didn't employ such a bright line rule. When Maybane brought out the pistol, he went first to a coffee table, removed the magazine, cleared the round in the chamber, then handed Williams the gun so he could check it out. Williams placed the loaded magazine and extra round onto the television stand. He got a sense for the pistol, getting to understand the sights and the triggers, and then he handed the firearm back to Maybane, who showed it to the others at the party. Following that smashing success of introducing firearms into a party atmosphere, Maybane brought out two other guns, another pistol and a lever-action rifle. Some of the men dry-fired the weapons to get to know how they handled a little bit better. Dry-firing the weapon means that they pulled the trigger, but there was no ammunition in the gun. At some point, Maybane pointed the Springfield 9mm at De Leon and dry-fired it, violating the first rule of handling a weapon. Wald also dry-fired the gun while pointing it at De Leon. As the group continued their hang, the various weapons were put to the side. The lever-action rifle got put behind a recliner, the second pistol got tucked between a wall and a couch, and the Springfield 9mm was put down under a coffee table. The party moved on, more cooking, more cigars, more drinking. They began to play a drinking game best described as similar to Monopoly, where players land on a space and drink or perform a specific task. From those context clues, my best guess is that it was Drinkopoly or something similar. Williams noticed that the 9mm magazine and spare round were still on the TV stand where he'd left them. He asked Deanie to pass them to him. He removed each round from the magazine, counted them, and reloaded the magazine. Task complete, he put the round and magazine on the windowsill near him. Maybane asked Williams to hand him the magazine and the extra bullet. He told the group he would go put the 9mm away upstairs. Instead, he put the magazine into the pistol, chambered around, ejected the magazine, and loaded the spare bullet. With the 9mm fully loaded, he placed it in his waistband. At some point, Maybane also recovered the second pistol from its spot tucked between the couch and the wall. Some amount of time later, Maybane began wrestling with De Leon. He gave Williams both pistols. Williams, who was tracking that Maybane loaded the 9mm, placed the firearm under his thighs while Maybane and De Leon wrestled. After Maybane and De Leon finished wrestling, Maybane asked for the 9mm back and returned it to his waistband. About six hours after the hangout started, around midnight, Maybane and De Leon began to wrestle again. Maybane reached into his waistband, pulled the 9mm out, and placed it against De Leon's head. Humes jumped up, telling Maybane to stop. He remembered there were live rounds in the gun. But it was too late. Maybane pulled the trigger, shooting and killing De Leon. Maybane asked Williams to call for help. Williams dialed and began to try and explain what happened. Dispatch asked for his location, which he didn't quite know. He passed the phone to Maybane to provide his address. Dispatch notified the Criminal Investigative Division for 29 Palms, who then notified the Naval Criminal Investigative Service. Agents for both CID and NCIS responded. To them, Maybane lied, claiming De Leon reached down into the sofa, pulled out a pistol, and died by suicide. NCIS collected Humes, Wilson, Wald, Deeney, and Maybane and brought them to NCIS headquarters just before 2 a.m. to begin the process of interviewing them separately. 
Dini described hearing the shot and seeing the smoke of the gunshot in the air around Maybane, but he didn't describe seeing the shot fired. Williams, Wald, and Humes similarly described hearing the gunshot. None of them described Maybane pulling the trigger, even though Humes jumped up in an attempt to stop Maybane from firing. While speaking with Wald, NCIS agents told him that the stories just weren't adding up. They said that the bullet's entry point made it clear that Wald pulled the trigger. Wald said that if he shot De Leon, he didn't remember doing it, and said he didn't even put the magazine inside the gun. Wald said that if he knew he'd done it, he would tell the special agents, but he didn't remember what happened. He suggested maybe he blocked it out. When the special agent left the room for a few minutes, Wald whispered to himself, It wasn't me. When agents returned and resumed questioning Wald, he admitted he'd played with the gun, then said, I guess, I guess I did it. There's really no arguing it. It was a stupid effing thing. It was a mistake. I didn't mean to do it. I effing killed somebody. The special agent asked Wald if he pulled the trigger, and he said he believed so. He guessed that if he'd been holding the gun, if he pulled the trigger, he must have picked the gun up from the floor or the couch after drinking some more. They went over the story again, and Wald described putting down his beer, picking up the gun, pointing it at De Leon, expecting the gun to be empty, then the sound of the gun firing, seeing De Leon slump. At the special agent's suggestion, Wald wrote a letter to De Leon's parents, apologizing for taking their son from them out of pure stupidity. While Wald was in pretrial confinement, Deanie returned to NCIS to explain that he remembered who was holding the gun immediately after it was fired, and it was Maybane. Deanie remained firm in his conviction and said the only way Wald could have fired the fatal shot would be if the bullet entered the back of De Leon's head. NCIS believed that was the case. But NCIS was wrong. The autopsy revealed that the wound near the back of De Leon's head was an exit wound. Twelve days after his confession, Wald recanted. He explained that he gave a false confession because of the mental state he was in during his interview. He'd been scared. He'd only gotten an hour of sleep. He felt horrible thinking about De Leon's family, and he wanted the questions to stop. The interviewing agent was the first to suggest that Wald fired the shot, told him that he must have fired the shot, given their perception of the bullet's flight path. While investigators are allowed to lie during interrogations, I don't actually think that's what happened here. It seems the special agents genuinely made an assessment about entry and exit wounds, and that they were wrong. My best practice for interviewing clients about something that's happened to them is to stick to open-ended questions, to avoid tainting their recollection with my own perceptions. The approach is almost certainly different. For investigators who are speaking with somebody they may believe is being uncooperative. But going over and over the story probably led to the illusory truth effect. Because when something is repeated enough, we start to believe it. Deanie, Williams, and Humes spoke with NCIS again. This time, each recounted Maybane holding a gun immediately after the shot was fired. Each described Wald sitting to De Leon's left. The bullet that killed De Leon was found in the wall to his left. Wald couldn't have been the shooter. The four corpsmen who witnessed De Leon's death and who went along with the story of him dying by suicide faced punishment for their role in his death. 
Ryan Deeney was found guilty of dereliction of duty causing death. He received a sentence of reduction from E6 to E5 and 100 days of confinement. Mason Williams was found guilty of dereliction of duty and disorderly conduct. He received a sentence of reduction from E4 to E1. Both Sterling Wald and Jesse Humes were charged with dereliction of duty and making false official statements. Maybane, the man who pulled the trigger and fired the bullet that killed Michael de Leon, initially accepted a plea agreement. However, he withdrew from the agreement and proceeded to a contested court martial where he pled not guilty. Maybane's court martial defense hung on the confession that Wald made. He was nevertheless convicted of one specification of reckless endangerment and one specification of involuntary manslaughter. He received a sentence of reduction to E1, forfeiture of all pay and allowances, confinement for six years, and a dishonorable discharge. Mabin claimed seven errors on appeal. He claimed, first, that he was denied the opportunity to present a complete defense because the judge ruled against admitting the recanted confession. Second, that the judge should have excluded one of the panel members for implied bias. Third, the convening authority made a technical error that made them an accuser. Fourth, the military judge should have granted him a continuance. Fifth, that the evidence was legally and factually insufficient to convict him of reckless endangerment. Sixth, that the evidence was factually insufficient to convict him of involuntary manslaughter. And finally, seventh, that he was entitled to a unanimous verdict. The Navy and Marine Corps Court of Criminal Appeals focused on the claim related to Wald's recanted confession, the challenged panel member, and the continuance the military judge denied. I think today it makes sense to focus on the excluded confession, but before we get there, I want to address the argument that Mabin was entitled to a unanimous verdict from his court-martial panel. If you're familiar with the civilian system of criminal justice, this probably made your ears perk up. The military is a jurisdiction that does not require unanimity in a jury conviction. The Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces previously ruled that split verdicts were legal. When appealed to the Supreme Court of the United States, the Supremes declined to weigh in. So, the split jury guilty verdict system remains intact. The Courts of Criminal Appeal don't have to address this question every time it comes up. I'd love to offer you some inside scoop about what goes on during jury deliberations and whether or not this is a system that makes sense. But I've never been picked for a jury. People really enjoy using their peremptory challenges to keep me out of the jury box. Lame. Turning to Wald's confession. The military judge excluded the recording of Wald's confession and the handwritten note Wald penned to De Leon's parents. The judge ruled that they were inadmissible, but that didn't mean that they couldn't be used to support Maybane's defense. The defense could still impeach Wald using the confession, they just couldn't point to it as gospel of what happened the night De Leon died. On direct, Wald testified that he'd previously admitted to killing De Leon. Mabin got to cross-examine Wald on his prior inconsistent statements. On appeal, Mabin argued that in excluding the recording of the confession and the handwritten note, the court-martial judge deprived him of his constitutional right to present a complete defense. The right to present relevant evidence to support a defense is not unlimited. Relevant evidence still has to be admissible evidence. We've seen it in episode 11, the Bowen case, and episode 32, the Becker case, that hearsay evidence, for example, doesn't come in unless it's subject to an exception. 
As a refresher, hearsay evidence is an out-of-court statement offered for the truth of the matter asserted. Episode 11 delved into the excited utterance exception, evaluating whether the nod of a head constituted an excited statement. Conceptually, excited utterances are allowed in because the stress of excitement makes artifice difficult and adds some reliability to a statement. I chose to focus on this evidence issue today because it's centered on a concept that I don't have much familiarity with, the residual hearsay exception. It's sort of a hearsay catch-all. The reason I'm not familiar with this concept is because California has not adopted the residual hearsay exception, but it is good law in federal courts and a number of other states. The exception, which is governed in military courts by Military Rule of Evidence 807, allows for the admission of otherwise excludable hearsay as long as it's material, necessary, and reliable. At the heart of the residual hearsay determination is the trustworthiness of the hearsay statement, the trustworthiness of what the declarant said outside of court. The residual exception is intended to be used very rarely and only in exceptional circumstances. Most other hearsay that comes in is subject to some other exception. In evaluating the reliability of hearsay under this residual hearsay exception, courts can consider whether there is corroborating evidence that supports the statement, the age and mental state of the declarant, the spontaneity and repetition of the statement, the circumstances under which the statement was made, whether suggestive questioning was used, and whether the declarant had motive to fabricate. Wald's confession didn't exactly have that reliability. There wasn't really corroborating evidence for his confession. In fact, the forensic exam directly contradicted his confession, and the bullet, lodged in the wall behind Wald, further undercut the veracity of his statements that he made in confessing to this crime. Nevertheless, Maybane asserted there was corroborating evidence. First, Wald was in the room. Second, Wald had previously expressed animosity towards De Leon. Third, Wald had previously dry-fired the gun while pointed at De Leon. Fourth, that Wald's plate was on the coffee table. And fifth, that Wald tested positive for gunpowder residue. This supposedly corroborating evidence was pretty weak. And, to the extent that the court-martial judge didn't consider some of these factors, the NMCCA said that functionally had no impact on the analysis. Looking to the other considerations, Wald was distraught, operating on just an hour of sleep after watching his friend die. He wasn't exactly in the healthiest mental state when he made his confession. And the confession wasn't made spontaneously. It came after Wald denied involvement, after he whispered to himself while he was alone in the interview room that it wasn't him. The interview made use of suggestive questioning and played to Wald's fraught emotional state, appealing to him to consider De Leon's family and write them a letter. Without any hallmarks of reliability, the confession couldn't come in under the residual hearsay exception. Further, the NMCCA concluded that Maybane could, and did, present a complete defense at trial. Nothing prevented his counsel from presenting all of that supposedly corroborating evidence at trial to turn the panel's attention to Wald, or from cross-examining Wald and establishing that he confessed. While Maybane couldn't introduce the recording of the confession or the letter to De Leon's parents, he got everything else in about Wald's confession. With all of that in mind, the NMCCA concluded that Maybane wasn't deprived of his constitutional rights. 
Maybain lost on the merits of his appeal, but the NMCCA did order the correction of a clerical error so that his judgment was accurately reflected in his record of court-martial. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's episode, please share it. I invite you to submit case suggestions and feedback to conductunbecomingpod at gmail.com or on conductunbecomingpod.com. Join me next time when we spring into a spiral. Until then, take care. Conduct Unbecoming is a podcast where I get to talk about interesting crimes and cases that involve U.S. military service members. I research, write, and produce the podcast myself. The opinions expressed are my own, and perhaps it's obvious. Conduct Unbecoming is not approved, authorized, or endorsed by the Department of Defense.